Hello, Lips. Hi. Uh, I am glad for... Uh, So, I'd like to benefit from your visiting uh, to our center to speak about what you think about cyber, cyber security. Mm. What your definition about cyber security from the Arabian view, uh, if, if I can say that. Yeah, so um, I'm honored to be here. I'm very happy to be talking to you about this important topic. And thank you very much for uh, inviting me to participate in your research on cybersecurity uh, in the region and globally more broadly. Uh, I see cybersecurity as having three distinct perspectives. There is the national perspective on cybersecurity, where the networks to be protected are those within the territorial boundaries of a state. So nations try and protect themselves against other nations and against non-state actors in cyberspace. That's the first. The second one is a corporate view of cybersecurity. Companies see cybersecurity as a risk to their profit, to their bottom line, and they try and protect their networks to ensure their business isn't damaged by cyber attacks. And finally, there is an individual one. An individual version of cybersecurity uh, is where people like you and me try and protect ourselves against whatever threats might be out there. And that is a different perspective to that of corporations and of governments. Mm. Uh, so, um, Mr. James, what do you think about, uh, uh, do you think that cyber security is, it is became, or it is becoming mm. uh, the aspect of national security for the, for the state, and it has become, become also uh, uh, a vital uh, role in uh, international security at all. So, what do you think about the international uh, institution like uh, organization and uh, related organization deal with the risk of uh, the dangers of the misusing of cybers, uh, cybers, uh, cyber space, mm -hmm. uh, especially uh, the, the, uh, the risk of uh, depending on uh, this domain uh, infrastructure and service and the uh, civic uh, the, uh, using from uh, millions of the users all over the world. Okay. How do you think uh, cyber security became uh, a raising issue mm -hmm. uh, in the policy making? Uh, thinking uh, in the think tank like your uh, center and our center we have we, we uh, also raise uh, raising about uh, raising our interest in this issue yeah. also. what do you think about this uh, progress how uh, this affect on uh, the models of uh, institutions uh, or so related with the government or related with the cyber uh, uh, civil uh, society yeah. uh, or related with the think tank, uh, deal with the raising this issue. Yes, I uh, think it's a really important question. Um, and to take the first part of your question about cyber security as a national security issue, um, that is very clearly the case. So most states around the world, whether in the Arab region, in the US and Europe, um, or elsewhere, uh, all see cyber security as a major priority for their national security. And this has changed significantly over the last few years. Um, initially, cyber security was not seen as a threat on the same level as traditional threats to national security. But that's very different. And a lot of cyber attacks to both uh, politically and uh, critical, critical infrastructure aspects of the state mm. um, over the last couple of years have demonstrated 
how important cybersecurity is for national security. The second part of your question was about international organisations mm. and the role of international organisations uh, in ensuring that states agree to some extent about what is allowed and what is not allowed in cyberspace. The UN has had some success in this progress, but it has also had a lot of faults. Um, there are deep divisions in the UN processes on cybersecurity, and I don't see those divisions being resolved soon. Um, there will continue to be disagreements for international organizations, and that will make it harder for there to be a unified view and for there to be clear red lines to rule out certain actions for states. The last part of your question, I think, was the most important one. It was about cybersecurity and the voice of users and of people and of civil society. And that, I think, is an often underplayed aspect of cybersecurity that we need to think about more. We think about states, we think about uh, state threats in cybersecurity, but the ways people can influence the standards, the underlying infrastructure, um, and have a voice at the table when these sort of decisions are being made, whether in international organizations or in standard setting bodies, we need to have a role for individual users in all regions of the world and for civil society representatives to make their case there as well. Um, I think that you, you, uh, you uh, know uh, about uh, internet governance. Mm. Uh, it is a model uh, of uh, global internet governance. It is uh, launched, uh, I think, uh, from uh, 2005 mm -hmm. in Tunisia. Yes. Uh, uh, this forum mm -hmm. focus on how to engage uh, all multi stakeholders to deal with uh, 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 internet policies yes. all by uh, all uh, participated from uh, civil society, from academia, mm -hmm. from media, from government. Yes. Um, uh, I think this view is very important to handle uh, the uh, attacks of cyber space or uh, cyber uh, attacks uh, especially on the, our countries or international community at all. Yeah. Uh, I think internet governance is a very important approach. Mm. How do you think it is uh, faced from uh, some problems uh, from uh, United States um, because of United States not uh, allow uh, for uh, allow for the uh, international community to share with the United States to uh, handle with the uh, internet infrastructure. Yes. Especially uh, United States uh, think, thinking in internet uh, at first it is uh, it is the American uh, invention. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think is that uh, internet governance although it is very important uh, progress for uh, the international community at all uh, but it is faced uh, some problems uh, from the United States also problem from China and Russia uh, it is uh, reflected uh, two vision mm. uh, one vision focus on uh, uh, sovereignty, the, uh, cyber sovereignty yeah. uh, from China and the Russia, yeah. uh, which is focused on cyberspace uh, m uh, must be applied by uh, internet sovereignty, like uh, like uh, like material, uh, like uh, any domains uh, which countries apply this uh, sovereignty. Yeah. Uh, but the United States focus on uh, not organizing uh, cyberspace mm -hmm. because of it is benefit from this uh, idea because of most of uh, global uh, company America. Yes, America very much so. Uh, if United States uh, uh, agree with 
uh, the East, like China and the Russia, mm. uh, to organize it. Uh, the cyberspace is affect their economy and their hegemony also. Yes. What what do you see about this? Yeah, so it's a it's a lot of it's a lot of issues. Um, so I would uh, bring them down into three areas. The first would be the question of the historical origin of the internet and internet governance structures in the U.S. Yes, um, and it's a undisputable fact that uh, the internet as we know it um, was invented and experimented and became successful um, with American structures, yes. with American uh, governance and with American corporate power as well. And what we see now is in a broader globalization of internet technologies, the spread of internet access um, to countries not only sort of in the east as well, but we have to remember the global south as well. Um, there are many people coming online very quickly, and we see this globalization of internet access. That means that there are different demands for internet governance than there were when the internet was primarily an American communications medium. And with struggles over specifically ICANN, Yes. Uh, we see tensions between the historical origin of the internet and demands for it to be represented in a different way. And when I speak to the people at ICANN, they are doing a very good job. They mean and want to really secure and organize the internet in the best way. Um, but they do see these political pressures um, feeding into their organize, organizational structures in an increasingly uh, obvious manner. That's the first aspect. The second one was about the voice of civil society in these structures. And I've touched a little bit on this in the last uh, question. I would say one thing here is that multi-stakeholderism is designed to be a process that includes civil society, that includes the voices of the individuals. But there's a risk that we see both state and corporate capture of multi-stakeholder processes where civil society representatives are either there but on a secondary level so their voices their views are not treated with the same weight as those of corporations or states or that these representatives themselves are captured by those interests so that is a although i wholeheartedly uh, support the idea of drawing voices to more stakeholders there's a danger there the final question was about bipolar models of internet governance between the West and the East and multi-stakeholderism and cyber sovereignty. I think also, um, uh, I'll just for the police, uh, uh, I think uh, um, the, the dilemma also uh, between East and West, mm. there is uh, more differentiated between uh, European Union and United States, especially uh, on how to deal with personal data. Yes. Uh, no, it is not uh, uh, only in uh, the, 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 the war between or the, the battle between East and East, mm. but also uh, between the alliance. Yeah, and I'm very glad you raised that yes. because my first point was going to be that we cannot think about it yes. in merely two camps. Mm. Yeah. The, especially the European Union yes. with GDPR, yes. um, the General Data Protection Regulation, and the US approach to data protection is diverging significantly. Um, and that also includes other questions about telecoms infrastructure uh, underpinning cyber security and cyberspace. So questions of net neutrality, yes. about allowing the same packets equal access, you know, to flow equally throughout, depend, not depending on price or other uh, differentiating factors is a very um, uh, tense point um, in discussions in the Euro Europe and the US. Um, and equally, on the other side, I think putting China and Russia in exactly the same place in internet governance is a simplification. Um, they have very different approaches both to uh, their national uh, ideas of what the internet should be, about how to control 
uh, and monitor what is going in and out of the country, um, but also very different economic relationships in the technologies underpinning the internet um, with the US. So China's um, interdependency um, in smartphones, in routers, in many of these technologies, media is, in social media, is really important. Um, and there's a big difference there. And finally, I just want to say that the Middle East, the Arab region, is in the middle, as it has historically always been. So it is a, a site of uh, tension between these two poles and seeing how cyber security and internet governance emerges in this region is a really important task. Yes. And um, as you say, can I see that you agree with uh, the world uh, go to balkanization of cyber space mm. from uh, globalization of uh, approach of globalization of cyber space? Uh, as you uh, uh, heard about uh, some news uh, speak about uh, Russia shut down internet and uh, isolated from the world. Mm. Uh, also, there is uh, also more, more uh, uh, international models uh, to uh, raise uh, uh, local internet, like yes. in Iran, like in yes. Brasilia, also mm. uh, in China, in Russia. Uh, do you think it, it is it is uh, shared of approach uh, or a new trends in the world to go to balkanization or fragmentation of cyber space? Mm -hmm. Do you think it is? It is uh, stand for uh, dangers for the uh, direct governance approach. Yeah, um, I and also uh, uh, cyber norms. Of course, how to apply cyber norms on the cyber space uh, if the or uh, if any countries mm -hmm. go to uh, fragmentation mm -hmm. uh, the. Uh, same business. Yes. So, again, a really important question. Um, and I think most analysts would, would paint the shift um, in the development of the internet and the governance of the internet in this way, that you have a globalization, um, an idea of the net as uh, enabling the freedom of communication between people all around the world, um, because there is now a borderless way to talk to people you know, on the opposite side of the world. Um, and then they're becoming balkanization. Um, states taking technical and policy routes uh, to ensure that they have control of their national internet. Um, and this recent Russian story is a really good example of that. The danger there, uh, as I see it, is that not only is it a potential uh, fragmentation in times of crisis, as the Russian example said, it said, in a situation where there is a severe crisis, this may need to be implemented. And that's why they claim to be uh, experimenting or trying to seek to experiment. Um, the danger is that that becomes normalized, that it's not only in times of crisis that states fragment or control their internet, that that becomes routine. Um, and I think that is the real prospect of balkanization that would be damaging for uh, a whole variety of reasons. Um, and onto cyber norms, um, there have been many uh, attempts to work out cyber norms in this area to um, ranging from the Italian manual on the rules of cyber warfare, um, you know, maybe going back 10 years now, which is a long time in cyberspace. Yeah. Um, and these cyber norms, I think, have a, um, have, a, have a one problem where the text is only half the battle. Right? Mm. So generally, norm scholars see the text as we've achieved something, we've achieved our norm. Mm. And I want to say, well, actually, what happens after the text is achieved, the implementation, the variation you get in interpretation of those norms after a norm is agreed is just as important. Mm. Um, what do you think about the uh, NATO effort mm. to handle with uh, cyber security, especially uh, as you see, uh, there is a uh, manual. Yes. 
it is uh, interested in how to apply uh, cyber norms mm -hmm. on the uh, the behaviors of the countries, especially on the NATO members. Yeah. How it is model go to globalization? Mm. How to uh, convert cyber norms, which uh, uh, is out uh, of uh, man, 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 uh, yeah. go to globalization, uh, maybe take a international convention on mm. cyberspace, uh, as we see uh, uh, the Budapest uh, convention. Yes. Uh, especially uh, focus on cyber crime. Mm -hmm. It is glow. In fact, it's glo uh, it's go globally globalization. Uh, do you think that Talim Manuel and cyber norms, which he, which uh, which uh, designed by NATO, yeah. uh, it may be go to globalization also? Mm -hmm. I think that is a real problem. Mm -hmm. um, in that NATO is an organization set up for a very specific purpose, mm -hmm. um, originally to counter the uh, Soviet threat, and we see from the leading members of NATO involved in cybersecurity, Estonia, that this remains a core part of its purpose to deal with cyber threats from Russia. And therefore, any NATO structures, especially those influenced by the small states um, threatened by Russia, will be very hard to globalize in that way. Um, and I think that is a real issue with um, the, the globalization of those norms. Um, in terms of the Budapest Convention, again, that is a good start. But the danger is that many, uh, so this is the Council of Europe, and many states have not acceded to the convention. Um, yet they have nonetheless produced laws on cybercrime that in some ways mirror the Budapest Convention. And in some ways, don't. So there's a lot of variation there. There's a lot of problems about relationships between national laws and the Budapest Convention that makes it hard to see any global pattern or consensus emerging. So, uh, how do I uh, withdraw you from the international level mm -hmm. to the regional level yeah. in our uh, Arab world? What is the, uh, the state of cyber security in Arab world? Mm. It is weak or it is strong. In the, uh, in the how to uh, progress our capability uh, on, on cyber security? Mm. Yeah. Uh, what is the weakness? What is the strength of cyber security in Arab world? Yeah. Um, and again, I would uh, go back to this original idea of there being three versions of cyber security the national, the corporate, any individual. And in the Arab world, you see there being significant threats in cybersecurity at all levels mm. to individuals, to businesses, and to states. Mm. Um, and in terms of improving cybersecurity, uh, this has to take a number of different routes. One is technical, one is having the ability for um, organizations, whether in states or in companies to really know their networks, to detect threats as and when they appear, and to mitigate those threats. They can't rely on a um, external defense that tries to prevent uh, attackers getting in. There will nearly always be a compromise in this way. So having the right tools, technologies to mitigate a compromise once it has occurred and limit the damage is really important. But there is also a question of the right people, the right skills and the right training. And I don't want to put too much effort on emphasis on the technology at the expense of the skills. I think having the right people, um, having a lot of enthusiastic uh, people working in cybersecurity is a really good thing. And in my time, here in the last few weeks, I've seen a lot of very enthusiastic people who really want to work in cybersecurity to protect whoever they're working with. Um, and finally, there is a question of awareness. And this is especially for the individual cybersecurity. Many people use uh, mobile phones and devices 
without being aware of the risks and the variety of threats that they may face, um, depending on what they're doing. So really educating people about what they might be at risk, what might be the result of certain communications or of certain links, things like that, is really important. And that awareness piece is another important plank of improving cybersecurity yes. in the region. Yes. Um, do you agree with me, uh, the non-state actors in mm -hmm. our region, especially like ISIS groups and the terrorist group, use social media and the internet at all to mobilize mm -hmm. the youth to participate in the conflict in Syria and Iraq. Yeah. Um, do you think that it is still dangerous for our region? Mm -hmm. uh, the non-state actors yeah. It is how it is uh, have their uh, own capability on cyber security. Uh, how to deal with this uh, non-state actors? This uh, from one side. Other side, mm -hmm. what do you think about uh, the cyber security as uh, a domain for conflict between uh, Iran and mm -hmm. the Gulf State, uh, Gulf uh, yeah. Arab Gulf countries? Uh, or between Turkish and um, and our region, mm. uh, it is the conflict between state for state. Other, there is a conflict between state and non-state actors. Yeah. What do you think it is affect on cyber security at all in our region, and do uh, how do you think that uh, the investment on in cyber security, especially in the Gulf state, uh, Gulf countries. Mm. Uh, it is enough to face this uh, challenge. Yeah, um, really, really good questions. <laughs> Again, um, so the first question on non-state actors. Yes. Um, so I'm glad you focused on social media aspects of non-state actors mm -hmm. and terrorist groups in the region, um, because there is a common hype, I think, about cyber terrorism. Yes about the ability of non-state actors to conduct damaging hacking operations um, against mm. uh, states and individuals. And I think that is often overplayed and people miss the fact that groups uh, such as Daesh use uh, cyberspace primarily for communication and recruitment. Um, and this will always be the case now, I think. We have to see uh, non cyberspace as a separate realm to what these groups are doing offline, but to see the two as really merge together, just as you would talk to someone um, to try and persuade them to join your course, cause you would now do that online through messaging. And especially you know, in the UK, we have seen um, trials of uh, in um, under terrorism legislation which rely heavily on these encrypted communications on social media platforms. So it's a very important point. Uh, the second point was this idea of state, interstate conflict. And that, in the region, that translating into conflict in cyberspace. Um, you are right to raise the question of Iran and uh, the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia, uh, because many of the most significant cyber attacks worldwide have happened in this region. From the original Stuxnet yes. in 2010 um, to the Saudi Aramco attack mm -hmm. in 2012. Um, and we see these cyber attacks becoming more frequent um, and becoming part of broad tensions and antagonism in the region. So. The bottom line, I think, would be where you see conflict, and unfortunately, the Middle East is a region with much conflict, there will also be conflict online. Um, um, I think that if, uh, although Oman, for example, mm -hmm. it is ranking for number one in cyber security, yeah. what I think is ref reflected the crisis of secure, cyber security in Gulf state, uh, Gulf countries. Especially, yeah, because of uh, Gulf countries focusing on uh, using the Western company to secure their infrastructure. Mm. It is a weak 
Oh, it is a song. Yeah. How do you, do you see this? Um, it's a great point. We, we have we, we, their countries not have ability. Yeah. Their own programming or, or have ability. Yeah. Local ability to uh, to promote uh, to promote their uh, defense or defense for cyber attacks and uh, and their own ability. Uh, to uh, uh, industry yeah. and programming yeah. and, and build, build the civil power yeah. to uh, handle with this uh, cyber attacks. Uh, You're exactly right. Mm -hmm. The problem in the early years of developing cyber security uh, in the Gulf states, especially after 2012 and the Saudi Aramco incident, yes. which was described by many as a wake-up call mm -hmm. for cybersecurity in the region, was that um, the model of outsourcing cybersecurity protection is very problematic mm -hmm. um, because it means that people who are within the organization do not know really to what extent their networks are protected. They don't know what to do or how to act in the event of an incident. And Secondly, the incentives for those providing such equipment are not always the best ones. They're not always aligned with those to whom they're selling it. So you may have uh, a lack of responsibility, um, a real gap in responsibility between the vendor, the provider, and the buyer. Um, I think that is changing, partly because there are greater economic pressures on cybersecurity um, since for, uh, the fall in the oil price a few years ago, um, and this is generalized across the region, there are real uh, economic fragilities um, that have an effect on cybersecurity procurement and budgets. Um, so these problematic contracts may be less the case. And also there is more awareness, there's more experience. Um, so this uh, outsourcing model is much more mature now. Um, and also, especially in the Gulf, uh, countries and organizations are doing a lot of training. They're doing a lot to try and encourage um, a national capability, uh, which hopefully will increase in the future. I think also uh, there is other point uh uh, focus on uh, the new trend in Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, to apply uh, 2013 uh, vision uh, to uh, diversity the yeah. economy in Saudi Arabia to go to digital economy, not depend on the national resources. Mm. I think it is very uh, important uh, uh, development yes. to handle with how to uh, raise our capability in cyber security and how to be active yes. uh, in, in, uh, in cyber security as a programming, as an industry, and how to use the digital economy mm. to improve our economy, uh, not, not uh, only focus on the gas and the petroleum yeah. as a resource for our income. Yeah, yeah I don't want to uh, say there are no uh, cyber security threats to uh, end the energy sector in oil and gas. There are, mm. and there are real, very real cyber security threats, especially as industrial control systems increasingly move online um, to IP communication. But that is small in comparison to the diversification of economies generally towards technology, technology dependent uh, um, economies. And that means that cybersecurity will be a much broader question for a whole range of sectors and people and let's remember individuals as well. Um, my last question will focus on how do you see that the international cooperation to improve uh, the cybersecurity? Mm. It is um, a good or it's not good? And how to uh, make a trust yeah. uh, in international cooperation to improve our uh, Service security limits. Yeah, um, I think there is a real uh, lack of trust mm. uh, 
globally but in the region as well. Um, there are deep political divides um, between states, um, historic alliances, uh, cooperation between states that has been going for maybe 20 years is now not looking like a useful avenue for cooperation in cyber security. Um, so I think this is maybe the lowest point um, or the point for most improvement uh, that there is, especially in this region, um, where there is a real lack of trust um, and international cooperation. And in, again, the cybersecurity world is not separate from the offline world. In order to get cooperation on issues in cyberspace, you have to also have cooperation in issues offline as well. Do you think that we, we, we should find out uh, cyber this initiative? I think the more cyber peace, cyber peace yes. I think is a great idea. Like think, what happened in the Cold War, as you mm, know. Yes. Uh, how to build, uh, how to build a uh, cyber peace initiative uh, to um, to decrease the intention yeah. in cyber space from one side and the other side in the land. Yeah. I think the the idea and the reasoning behind the cyber peace initiative is a really great one. And we see in the work of big tech companies like Microsoft that they are trying to do this. And the reason they are stepping into this space is because states, although they are have the ability to create trust and cooperation, also undermine that trust and cooperation. They are as much the threats as they are the ones that are protecting against the threats, which is why Microsoft and others are doing this instead. But what you really need are non-governmental and non-corporate organizations, you know, think tanks, universities, separate civil society organizations, saying here's what we need in order to have cyber peace, to give them a voice. It is a uh, very nice uh, finishing for our meeting. And I'm uh, very grateful for you, for your intervention, for your ideas, uh, for your uh, visiting in our center. And I hope to make uh, a cooperation between us in the future. And I hope for you uh, good uh, life and good work. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.